It's the 21st century, and we're the richest, the healthiest, and the most educated we've ever been. Nevertheless, we continue to deal with great inequality, social division, and the threat of climate change. But luckily, the world is changing. Again. Welcome to the era of relevance, where the world is starting to use business as a force for good to create meaningful change with financial and societal value. Introducing the Unusual Pioneers, a program that connects social entrepreneurs with like-minded individuals around the globe to develop and learn new skills from high-profile mentors and experts in order to grow ideas into business. Meet one of our Unusual Pioneers. My name is Ruchika Singho and I lead Medtronic Labs, which is our social business initiative focused on expanding access to healthcare for underserved communities worldwide. Worldwide. I have spent my entire career learning about health and healthcare. That's what I'm good at, and that's what I want to give back to the world and solve the problems. Large business has a role to play just because of the scale of operations and the resources, and having that network and community of people who are excited to make a difference. <laughs> And I think if we could use our ability to think and solve problems to just make a good life available to all of humanity, that's a good goal. Social entrepreneurs pave the way for a resilient and purpose-driven economy, but everyone needs support. The Unusual Pioneers program is here to help them do it. In partnership with the World Economic Forum's Schwab Foundation for Social Entrepreneurship, we take entrepreneurs on a journey to impact. Unusual pioneers. It's so welcome everybody now to the public part of our executive circle of the unusual pioneers. Um, we're welcoming everyone now that is also dropping in onto the live stream for our um, unusual um, pioneers talk today. My name is Saskia Broisten, and I'm one of the co-founders and also CEO of Uno Social Business. Um, and I am joined uh, with my co-moderator, Francois Bonici, who is the director of the Schwab Foundation and also head of social innovation at the World Economic Forum. We'll be moderating this session here today. So welcome to everyone joining us on the live stream next to um, the executive circle of the unusual pioneers who you can already see here in the room, um, executives from large corporations um, that have social business programs running within those corporations. Um, today is a very, very special day because we are officially kicking off the Unusual Pioneers program and also the executive circle. Um, and uh, just for everyone who hasn't joined us before, the Unusual Pioneers uh, is a platform for corporate social entrepreneurs and their executives to grow their corporate social businesses and help transform those companies as a whole for the better. The Unusual Pioneers is initiated by UNO you know, Social Business um, in partnership with the Schwab Foundation for Social Entrepreneurship, sister organization of the World Economic Forum. Um, and um, today uh, I'm very delighted uh, to um, mention and announce two very special guests of ours. Um, Professor Yunus is the one, a uh, Peace Nobel laureate and one of uh, my personal mentors for the last decade. Um, and Paul Paulman, another um, inspiration of mine, um, the former CEO of Unilever, now uh, co-chair of Imagine, um, and of course, co-chair of a number of initiatives that are linked to the topic of transforming business uh, into a force for good. Um, with these two absolutely extraordinary individuals, we will be speaking today about how concretely we can help transform global corporations into a force for good. Um, and I mean, I think many of you have heard these words being used over and over again, and sometimes also misused uh, in terms of greenwashing. Um, but today we will be speaking to two people who've actually not just talked about it, but have actually done it and has, have actually you know, made significant, significant impact through business on the lives of humans and also onto the planet. Onto the, onto the planet. So we will be speaking today on 
the how to transform a business into a force for good rather than why we have to do that. Because I also hope that everyone in the room here that is um, listening on the live stream and also, of course, the executives in the room are already convinced that a why is a check mark. <laughs> So um, today, exceptionally, we're live streaming this rather than every one of you being in this one room, because obviously it's uh, in parallel, we're running the, uh, the executive circle. But I would still like to encourage everyone that's listening on the live stream to still um, put in the chat any of the questions that you have. The team will be forwarding those questions to us as moderators, and we'll try to weave it into the discussion as it happens um, over the next um, hour or so. And please also share in the chat where you're dialing in from um, and uh, why you're interested in what we're talking about here today. Um, with that, I'll hand over in a second to Francois Bonici, my co-moderator from the Schwab Foundation. He will be speaking to Professor Yunus and be interviewing him for about 15, 20 minutes um, before he hands back over to me. Um, and I'll be uh, uh, asking some questions uh, to Paul Paulman um, on those that's very important topic of transforming corporations into a force for good. So with that, Francois, I'll hand over to you uh, to kick us off. And uh, again, big welcome to everyone, both in the room and on the live stream for joining us here today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Saskia. Welcome to uh, all of our guests uh, around the world. Uh, again, a special welcome to Professor Mohamed Yunus and Paul Pullman. Uh, in a way, a convergence of experiences uh, and impact from different institutions uh, over many years to join on this topic uh, around transforming corporations in very concrete ways. Uh, I had the pleasure of uh, having interacted with uh, Professor Yunus uh, over a number of times over a period of the last uh, two decades, uh, he was a founding board member of the Schwab Foundation uh, and was heavily influential in bringing the approaches of social entrepreneurs into the World Economic Forum's uh, world and influencing business leaders for many, many years. Many of you know him, of course, Nobel Laureate. Professor Yunus is the father of both social business and microcredit, founder of Grameen Bank and more than 50 other companies in Bangladesh. For constant innovation and enterprise, the Fortune magazine named Professor Yunus uh, one of the greatest entrepreneurs of our time. Of course, in 2006, Professor Yunus and Grameen Bank were jointly awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. He's the recipient of probably more degrees than I would be able to do in a lifetime. Um, he's one of only seven individuals to receive the Nobel Peace Prize, United States Presidential Medal of Freedom, and the US Congressional Gold Medal. Uh, and you may have seen very recently, the International Olympic Committee conferred upon him uh, the Olympic Laurel, a relatively new award uh, provided and uh, conferred for his extensive work uh, in sports for development through uh, Yunus Sports Hub. Uh, Professor Yunus, it's a privilege to really be here and be in conversation with you today. Um, while it's uh, optimistic uh, to be able to be here and have this conversation, uh, our world is burning, our world is flooding, and our world is in uh, severe grips of a pandemic uh, extending inequalities. You speak of, of no going back. W what is it that's happening right now? And, and what is it about the status quo that we need to change that ensures that we don't go back uh, to the way things were yeah. before the pandemic? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you already mentioned uh, all the things that... Uh, so this is uh, something that we have to pay serious attention right now. One is the global warming, which is, you just mentioned. Uh, you said the world is burning. I, I express it by saying our house is burning. I said our house is burning, but uh, inside the house, uh, we are having parties, uh, celebrating our growth rate. We are celebrating our technological achievements and many other things without worrying about the uh, fire in the house. I said, uh, if we are sane people, we'd be coming out of the house, try to stop the fire first before we go into celebrations and so on. So this is the message of the day with the pandemic because we had, pandemic has revealed all the bad things that we have done to this planet. It bring it out very concretely. Uh, global warming is one uh, very uh, report that came out uh, from IPCC recently. It doesn't give us much time. And that puts human being as the most endangered species on this planet right now. 
Uh, but we don't want to admit that. We want to say, okay, it's 1.5 degrees Celsius in 10, 20 years or what. Uh, we still have more time to go. We don't have more time to go. So urgency of it, uh, immediacy of it, that is completely missed out. And the pandemic brings it out again that uh, we don't have much time on the global warming side. Another is extreme wealth concentration. Uh, all the wealth is concentrated in fewer and fewer hands in every second. Uh, the money, all the wealth going in one direction. And if you look at the uh, income map uh, globally, you'll see all the people at the bottom of the income map, uh, wealth map, with all, and they have very little wealth together. And all the wealth is up in the sky in the income map, uh, in, in almost in the outer space, uh, where a handful of people own 99% of the wealth of the world. So the 1% for 99% of the population who are at the bottom, and 99% wealth at the bottom, at the top of the world, 1% people doing that. It's not a static uh, picture. It's a, a dynamic picture. It keeps widening. Uh, they are in the outer space now. They will be super outer space tomorrow. That's how. But the people at the bottom remains static down there. So the space uh, distance between the people and the wealth is getting wider and wider. Is a segregation between people and the wealth. I said, this is a dangerous path. Uh, this will explode by itself. It's a very explosive situation. Uh, as I, I keep saying that it's a ticking time bomb. Even during the pandemic, if you just look, uh, we're all aware how suddenly this pandemic came and millions, even billions of people lost their livelihood, lost their income, lost their food. Uh, They're pushed down to poverty line who slightly wrote, put their nose above the poverty line, they're pushed back. Those who are comfortably above the poverty line, they were brought very close to the poverty line. This is what happening at the bottom of the picture. At the top of the picture, they are having trillions of dollars added uh, uh, wealth for themselves during the same period. Uh, meaning that their distance again, even in the pandemic situation, their wealth continues to grow. So this is the, Dangerous part of it. The third one that they should mention during this period that uh, makes us uh, very worried about it. Uh, the extreme attachment to the profit, uh, uh, like the vaccine shows it very well. We have been screaming for many, many uh, months now, uh, more than a year right now, appealing to the world to make the vaccine a common good, meaning that it would not have patent right on it so that it could be produced anywhere in the world. And today, uh, we have built such a heavy wall around the vaccines, walls of profit maximization, so that nobody can enter into that site, uh, which we were trying to do, uh, bring the vaccine out of the profit wall and make it, share it to everybody else so that people can get it. So even, even what we have right now, the capacity of production fully utilized, is still it will be a fraction of people who will get it. Uh, despite the, all your efforts to donate it, rich, people, rich countries giving the money to buy it and so on, still the capacity doesn't exist. Uh, so we need 11 billion uh, dosages of uh, vaccines for the world. Uh, to, today we have hardly 2 billion, 9 billion missing. So as we have been saying that no, we open it up, patent free, every country can be producing their own vaccines so that you don't have to wait for few uh, handful of companies to do that. So this again focuses on the uh, abuse of the maximization of profit, uh, uh, how life is at the stake uh, where people are dying, but you don't care because the business means profit maximization. Mm -hmm. That's the thesis that they have learned. So this is what the em emergency situation. And we said, we don't want to go back to that world, which led us to this situation. We have to re-engineer our new design so that we can get out of all these problems of global warming, wealth concentration, and all the profit maximization evils that we have created around us so that we can create a different kind of world. We say we shouldn't go to, to the old roads. Old road will take us to the old destination of destruction and the suicidal path. So we have to build new roads to go to the new destination so that we can build, build a new world for ourselves. I'll stop here. You have traveled many roads and you have been advocating for um your fellow citizens uh, who live uh, below the poverty line, but also on behalf of all of us, looking at you know what are these alternative roads, uh, and you've experimented with many different models over the last couple of decades. Uh, I'd like to dig down into if you can share some examples of us with us specifically around 
um, corporate uh, and business uh, partnerships that you've uh, created. Many people are aware of your work with Grameen and in microcredit, but really you did some early uh, important work in partnership with some very large corporations. And perhaps you'd give us some examples and tell us what inspired you most about that uh, as you started to walk those alternative roads. Well, the most interesting one you'll have with your group now coming up, Emmanuel Faber, who is the general, uh, former general CEO. He was the most uh, enthusiastic guy to bring us together with the Danone to uh, create a social business in Bangladesh called Jameen Danone Food Company to bring um, yoga of a special kind with the micronutrients for the children who are malnourished. And this is the one I think. But that it created so many instances by, uh, in order to do that tiny little company. First, they couldn't get the money from the company because lawyers said you cannot use the money in the company because shareholders gave this money to give them profit. Well, you cannot use this money to invest in a company which promises upfront they will never give you any dividend. This is a social business. So this will be uh, out of your mandate. So they couldn't use the company money. So what they did, they wrote to all the shareholders in Danone saying that this is what we're going to do. This is what you are getting the dividend this year. If you want to use a part of your dividend to invest in this, it's your choice. If you want, put a tick mark on the box, then tell us how much you want to invest in this. 98% of the shareholders signed up to invest in this little company in Bangladesh. It generated 35, billion, 35 million euro. We wanted only half a million euro for this, uh, the non side. We gave half a million, they will give half a million. This is what they're trying to do, raise half a million by the, from the shareholders directly. Now they created 35 million euro for them. So they were very happy, but that, that happiness didn't last long because the employees started criticizing the uh, management. But do you, con do you consider as a second class citizen? You ask the shareholders to uh, participate in this company. You didn't ask us. We don't belong to this company. So the management had to write another letter to addressing all the employees. And ultimately, 30 million euros were invested in this new company. So 30, this made 65 million euro, which uh, only idea was to raise half a million. So out of this 65 million, they created a Danone uh, com community fund, which is a social business investment fund, and which continues to grow. So it was started as a tiny little thing in Bangladesh, but it led to the creation of many companies who were investing this and so on and so forth. So the Frank Ribot is the one who initiated the whole process. And uh, um, Emmanuel Faber is the one who led the thing that built the whole team out of it. This is a wonderful experience that there were all the ideas that came. And then McCain, another company who approached us to create a social business. And luckily every case, they are the one who approached us. We are not the one lobbying for them. So we didn't even know them. Uh, we didn't even hear the name of the company in, uh, uh, before, but they approached us. And out of that came uh, Jean, Jean Bernot, who was the head of the European operation. Uh, he created a social business company uh, to use the throwaway uh, uh, potatoes. This is a potato company. They throw away potato because uh, not all potato is suitable for uh, maximum number of French fries coming out of the potato. So they have to vary a special kind of shape of the potato. If it is not fitting to the shape of the machine, they don't buy it. So about 30% of the potatoes are just thrown away. Nobody buys it because it doesn't fit into the French fry machines. Uh, so this is has, uh, this total waste. So he figured out why don't we create a social business, buy all the throw away potatoes and create potato soup. So that became a very good idea that they started produce, uh, producing potato soup and French uh, uh, chefs came out with their special recipe for this uh, McCain uh, soup, uh, potato soup. And then he got the idea that we can expand it to vegetables uh, because uh, we see in the vegetable market, 40% of the vegetables are thrown away because these are ugly vegetables. It's a, it's a technical business name is ugly vegetable, meaning these are not sellable on the counter at the, at the at the grocery shops or the supermarket because it's not the right shape. It's a cucumber, which is fat on one end, thin on another end, nobody buys it. So you have to be very perfect shape, then you can sell. It. So not every vegetable is, it comes in a perfect shape. So these are all thrown away. What the McCain did, so they bought all the throwaway vegetables and it started two things. One is a chopped off vegetables uh, to ready to cook vegetables. So when you chop it off, 
nobody knows what the sh original shape was. So the shape is gone and it becomes very good food for the people and not cheap because it's a throwaway vegetable anyway. So you can buy it cheap. Uh, second, the one they do, they do the vegetable soup. They are, with the experience of potato soup, they introduce another uh, idea of uh, vegetable soup. So these are, each one is an exciting idea and everything we do and we have created joint ventures with Uniqlo, which is a Japanese company. Another one is U Uglena in Japan, uh, uh, Japan auto uh, company. Of which is a training. Tell us what you did with uh, Uniqlo and these companies, please. Uh, Uniqlo is, uh, uh, see, the idea that we developed uh, together, uh, Uniqlo produces lots of their fab, uh, uh, garments in Bangladesh, they were, because Bangladesh is one of the suppliers of them. And I suggested that you throw away lots of waste out of this thing. You don't use all the parts. But if you bring this up, all the waste, this become beautiful garment for the poor people and very inexpensive clothing for the children and so on. Ch poor children always clo wear clothes which is dirty, which is torn, which is not good looking and so on. So I said, you can change everything. So use this, uh, create a whole new line of businesses, make it very cheap because you are not, these are thrown away anyway. So you just give it and uh, give it a, all the designs into it and bring the unique clothes flavor into it. So now they have 11 stores in Bangladesh uh, selling these uh, 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 garments for the poor people. And you have big lines of people buying this. And then they came up with the uh, blanket because Bangladesh, when winter comes, uh, which uh, sometimes winter becomes very severe uh, for a few days and people die, old people die, children have the, uh, colds and so on because our homes are not protected from the cold weather. We are home, built for warm weather. So people get exposed. So he, they came out with a blanket, beautiful blankets, uh, very cheap. Uh, so let, it's a dollar and a half or something like that. Uh, you can buy it because it all beautiful dresses and so on. So whole idea of social business is to cover the cost, uh, not interested in making personal profit out of it. If the profit comes, profit is rolled back into the business. So this is another unique clothing. And I know through all of your ventures, while you've spoken quite a lot about you know, almost the circular economy principles in, in what you were building, it was also around the creation of uh, jobs and livelihoods for and, protect, and social protection uh, for families. So it wasn't only about you know, a sustainable business model, but a really inclusive one. Uh, and that's one, just to quickly cool. mention that one of the things, theme that I continue to raise, I said human beings are not born to work for somebody else. Human beings are born as entrepreneurs but you never give them a chance to become an entrepreneur. Every, all are wrong thinking, wrong education. Education creates uh, job ready young people rather than be, uh, being entrepreneurs, uh, telling them that you are entrepreneurs, prepare for themselves, prepare for it. So what we have done, we address all the unemployed young people in Bangladesh, particularly children of Grameen families that um, we send them to school, give them education loan and so on, but don't, there's no job. So to keep complaining that, why did you send us to school? We have no jobs. I said, why are you looking for jobs? Uh, you t t tell yourself repeatedly that I'm not a job seeker. I'm a job creator. I'm an entrepreneur. And when you believe in that, come to us with a business idea, we'll invest in your business. So we created social business venture capital fund. So when these young people come with a business idea, we invest in their business in a social business way that we tell them that all you have to do, be successful and return the money to us Whatever we have given, we are not interested in your profit, but that's another world. We don't, we don't belong to the profit making world. So you just return the money that we give you. And then if you're ready to take a second round of uh, investment, come back again, do that. So now young people are coming with business ideas and so on, turning themselves into entrepreneurs. Now we have over 70,000 young people uh, where we invest in this and they come back and take the second one. And in the meantime, more and more young people, boys and girls coming with business ideas and so on. So this is another one that how to transform unemployed young people into entrepreneur by creating social business venture capital fund. So that's another social business idea. Thank you so much for, for sharing all of that. I think in, in the last part of this uh, fireside chat, uh, we just have a few minutes left. I think we want to, take all of those experiences and look forward. I think you know, what you've done for, for us and for the world is to, uh, you know, is this unusual leadership role of, of, of not accepting the boundaries and the models that we built uh, in the 19th and 20th century, this industry, but really proposing 
you know, new models of business uh, that I think that's why so many, I guess, companies have come to you to explore and to uh, design that together. Um, that is now really a global movement and there are people with inside all companies uh, who are trying to develop, transform uh, and create socially and environmental impact through the businesses uh, that they work in. And of course, we call these people social entrepreneurs now. Um, I'm interested, what, what is your advice to them? So we have a cohort of them in this series called Unusual Pioneers, but we know that there are, you know, many of them, we have a community in the Schwab Foundation now, also working on social entrepreneurs. Um, and, and what is your advice to them? There are thousands of them around the world. What is your advice to well, entrepreneurs, but, thing, also, yeah. but also to their corporate leaders? And we have an executive circle here. So what is your yeah, advice right. to leaders in the world and to entrepreneurs? First of all, uh, I'll mention to the young people in the companies and so on, uh, all outside the companies. I say, youth means creativity. Enormous creativity is blocked into their inside of them. Um, help them to understand that the creativity is uh, something which is they're born with. Uh, how to unleash this creativity. Uh, so while they're working with the companies, uh, how to bring their creative power, because if they just fit into the slot like a job, do the routine work, they'll be dead. They're nobody because uh, they are just uh, doing the routine work, whatever we're told and so on. So how to become alive as a human being, bring out the creative power and think of uh, ideas or the problems that you see around the world that some we just mentioned about global warming and so on and so forth. Uh, how to translate this problem into a business of social business kind. So creativity is the, is the thing that it's not that you will be doing it. First, you think can be done and you created that idea. Somebody will do it. And that's what the you know, social business is all about. You bring the idea. Uh, if you are not doing it, somebody else will do it. But the idea is the most fantastic thing to happen uh, to bring up that idea. So many things, how to address the global warming and within your company, if you want to do it you know, within your company. Uh, how do you uh, reduce the fossil fuel? How to bring the renewable energy into your company? This is, a, this is an idea, it create a social business idea in, into that. And not only you'll be doing it as a social business for the company, now this becomes a company by itself. All you do brings uh, in, uh, renewable energy in every company because you come out, come out with the solution how to do that, renewable energy, how to get rid of the fossil fuel. This is one big contribution. How to get away from the plastic within your company, just no plastic. We, we, we don't, this is, this is something you come up with a creative idea and a business idea, not just a charity thing. Okay, pick up some plastic every day as you come out of the office. It's not, it's a business idea, your creative idea to have that. And then you can sell it to your company that uh, would you be interested? If you're not, there'll be somebody else who'll be interested because it's such a fascinating thing that the you know, social business is all about, how to make that happen, the, the connection thing happen. Uh, how to, for example, uh, uh, take care of all the waste that your company creates. Every company creates enormous amount of waste and nobody talks about it. You talk about it. This is the waste. We want to make it recyclable and redesign a whole business out of it and create a fantastic business, not for our own company alone, because business idea doesn't have any boundary. You create an idea inside your company, company will be very happy that you did that, and they take the lead. At the same time, it became a global property. And luckily for this idea that we say in social business, there is no pattern. We don't, we, 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 as Emmanuel will tell you, we say, we don't have a copyright, we have copy left. We, we just go and uh, invite you to copy us, uh, do us. That's what the social business is all about. Uh, invite everybody to take it. And we'll, we'll be jumping around to tell you how to do that rather than hide you from it. We share with everybody. It's a global thing. So you bring that idea. So there's enormous thing that you have already within your company. You don't have to discover it. These are for every single company. The, the thing that I mentioned right now, the waste and the um, energy and so on and so forth. If you can create a social business venture capital fund to encourage young people to become entrepreneur and you address your own young people within the company to become entrepreneur. So you don't have to be trapped into a uh, business structure that you got in. You become an entrepreneur yourself. So come up with the idea how to make it happen. Come up with business ideas while you're working for another business, a social business idea to address the problem that you see exist in the world. That's the enormous, because you have the enormous capacity to see how businesses work, but you're working that to transform it into a completely different way to solve the problem of the people rather than just make money out of it. 
Thank you so much, uh, Professor Yunus, uh, for not only your philosophy, your passion, but you know, really provocative, but concrete ideas you've done it. And, and I think now we're seeing so many other companies ask, uh, set these same targets. And so delighted now uh, to be able to hand over to another uh, esteemed uh, and inspiring leader, uh, Paul Polman, and allow uh, Saskia Briston to uh, take on our next fireside chat. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Yunus. He's a great friend for a long, long time, Paul. Wonderful to see you. Yeah. Likewise, likewise, Mohamed. Absolutely. And Paul, a big, big welcome also from my end. We're delighted that you're sharing your um, time with us. Um, Paul Palmer also is one of those people that doesn't need a lot of introduction, but I will mention a couple of things. He's obviously a thought leader, but also an action leader in the whole field of making business a force uh, for good. He has just recently uh, wrote a book called Net Positive, How Courageous Companies Thrive by Giving More Than They Take. So that's coming out in October. So you should all stay tuned and check that out. Um, he obviously uh, was the CEO um, of Unilever um, and has really made an incredible dent into this uh, multi-billion uh, euro company, um, has played a ro role as an SDG advocate together with Professor Yunus over the years in making sure that the business community adopts the SDGs as something that they're also aiming for. Um, and now very recently, just a few years ago, has also co-founded something called Imagine, um, where he's also helping other companies to, to go down that path. So Paul, big, big welcome to you. And we're totally excited to have you to share your wisdom and your lessons learned over the last decade or so. Um, and Paul, I'll, um, I'll jump right in. I mean, we, we just heard that you have a new book out. Um, so probably you've uh, distilled all of your wisdom into those pages. But if we can get a little bit of a sneak preview um, in the sense that um, we'd love to actually hear what you envisage a transformed company to look like. What does in your eyes a so-called net positive, sorry, um, company actually look like? Because we're often speaking about transforming towards a purpose-driven organization and so on and so on. But these are all these beautiful buzzwords. Um, and in some ways, if you could define that for us to say, what is the end state that we want to go to? I think that would be very helpful for all of the uh, um, uh, CEOs and leaders in the room here, as well as, of course, for the broader, broader audience. Yeah, let me first thank you, uh, Saskia, for the opportunity and obviously the unusual Pioneers program. And also uh, great to see my friend uh, Mohamed there. I still uh, think back often on the wonderful dinner we had in Bangladesh at his house thank and you. discussed the state thank of the you. world. So I hope that we have an opportunity to do that soon again. We all feel a little bit trapped and um, but hopefully have used the time well. Um, you know, part of the thing I did was write a book. Uh, I didn't want to write a book, but anyway, more, more and more people said you need to share something. But I felt most CEOs that write a book is either to change their history or build their egos. And both of them were not appealing to me. So uh, it's not about myself or Unilever. It's really of what I think the role of business should be in society moving forward. And the reason I gave it the title net positive is that, that I really want to create a movement a movement that describes a little bit like Muhammad was saying that how the successful companies uh, profit from not creating the world's problems, but actually solving the world's problems. I believe for a business to be longer term successful, they actually need to show that they have a positive impact on the world. Otherwise, uh, why would we leave these uh, businesses around? So it requires a different definition of performance, a different process of value creation, much of what you discussed in this enlightening panel before that goes well beyond financial return, but also includes uh, people and, uh, and planet if you want to. I call it moving from CSR, where at best most companies are right now, corporate social responsibility, which is about being less bad, to what I call responsible social corporations, RSC. So embedding um, sustainability at the heart of your strategy, which I think is becoming increasingly an imperative to be a successful company. The um, What we're seeing now, uh, and COVID has helped a little bit with our reflections, is that we're heading towards a, a more regenerative and just future. Last year, uh, World Overshoot Day was July 29th, which is the day that we use more resources than the world can replenish. 
after that day, if you want to, we're actually stealing from future generations. People talk about circular economies or, or sustainable sourcing, and that's all fine, but we need to actually think about um, regenerative, replenishing, recreating uh, to restore uh, the health of, of this planet and, and the people. And that's very much what the book will cover. Um, we also talk about a, uh, it has to become uh, a, a core of the corporate strategy with a bigger outcome than a company alone. We have to have a bigger role in society to drive these more transformative changes and become systemic actors in, in changing this world. So we talk about five specific characteristics in the book that should come as no surprise. The first one is that companies should take ownership of their full impacts and consequences in the world, intended or not. We cannot just start, uh, celebrate a few things that we think we do well, but then have devastating impacts on the other side. For Unilever, that would mean being responsible for deforestation if you're in the food business. 60, 70% of deforestation is because of the way we produce food. For the poor uh, 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 lives of uh, smallholder farmers, for the uh, obesity, if you want to, for the stunting. You have to take effect of your total impact. And so often we see companies abdicating that responsibility. They think you can outsource your value chain, but uh, also by doing so outsource your responsibilities and that doesn't work anymore. The second one is that the company needs to operate for the longer term benefit of business and society. You cannot address these issues that Mohamed talked about of, of poverty or climate change or food security by running the red race of quarterly profits. You need to take a longer term view. And then most importantly, the third point is you need to ensure that you optimize and I deliberately use the word optimize versus maximize uh, the benefits to all stakeholders. You cannot run a company just for your shareholders. You have to ensure that the people that actually build your company, which is far more than people that provide capital, to be honest, are also benefiting from that uh, wealth creation that you do. And that, as a result, I bring po point number four, shareholder value is not an objective what you do, but it's an ultimate result of what you have done by really focusing on serving the people that, uh, that need it most. And then last but not least, I believe increasingly that these net positive companies are actively involved in the broader transformation that society needs. We, we are seeing a very difficult moment for governments, for multilateralism or globalization, if you want to. And, and uh, you see the uh, governments incapable of making the right decisions, be it around climate change, be it around vaccines, etc. I believe that smart companies will fill that vacuum. They will speak up and they will help drive these system changes. On climate change now, we're working the COP26 for Glasgow. And here again, we're trying to get these alliances of responsible companies that really uh, hopefully give the politicians more courage. At the end of the day, I think Mohamed will agree with me, these are companies that are driven by a, a strong sense of purpose. Uh, there's often a misconception that you cannot have uh, purpose-driven and profit-driven at the same time. And I think that's a fallacy. Uh, you can only achieve a reasonable return to keep doing what you're doing if you really are having this purpose at the at the core, which uh, Colin Meyer describes as to profitably address the issues of people and planet. Fantastic. So basically take full ownership of the, of the total impact your company has, focus on the longer term and actually optimize the benefits to all are, are some of those key takeaways from what you just said. But I'm just talking since you just uh, sort of came onto that notion of talking about purpose. And I think that's one of those typical buzzwords that's happening right now. Um, and I think when I, when I spoke to you once, you said that, um, well, talking about purpose is, is, that's not enough. You can't just sort of talk about purpose and then think that your company is going to change from one day to the other. So how do you really, when you really want to change the way a company behaves and actually behaves towards society, what really is required to make that transformation possible? So they are better companies and they're not just, you know, maybe even a CEO saying something good, but the rest of the organization perhaps just continue in business as usual. How do you do that? Yeah, indeed, uh, Saskia, purpose alone is not enough. Enron had a purpose statement, so had Wells Fargo, Boeing, GE. 
and frankly, many of the banks who have had uh, hundreds of billions of fines. So uh, it's obviously uh, two other things that you need to work on. It is uh, you need to get it into your culture, uh, which really boils down to behavior. If you cannot match your purpose statements with your behavior to actually make it come alive, then uh, you get dysfunctional uh, companies. And I think we see a lot of um, of uh, uh, examples of that. Uh, many companies that set lofty goals or uh, sign declarations, but that is not matched by uh, by uh, actual uh, action. 75% um, of CEOs think that they are purpose driven companies. But if you ask their employees, less than 15% of the employees think that they're actually working for a purpose driven <coughs> company. And that gap needs to be closed. So I think the biggest problem we have right now is the say do gap. And it starts really with leadership. We imagine we try to focus as much on personal transformation or leadership transformation as we try to focus on systems transformation. When I started the process in Unilever now 12, 13 years ago and, and brought um, purpose to the, the core and made that really our strategy, uh, in our case, we called it making sustainable living commonplace. I worked first with uh, Bill George for a year, an entire year. Uh, Bill, I should have mentioned, has written this book called True Norse, uh, which really talks about your own crucibles and finding your purpose. But I thought it was important to ensure that all of our employees would understand what their purpose were so that we collectively could build the company purpose. Just like you can't have a sustainable company if you're not sustainable yourself, you can't develop a purpose-driven company if you don't have that sense of purpose yourself. So we spend an entire year on that leadership transformation. Uh, that is now a course in Unilever that is still the most popular. Most of the people in the company have gone through it. 75% of all transformations fail uh, in the world. So so I realize how difficult that is because they they lack the, the methods or the processes or the, they are way too complex in things. Uh, they don't have the uh, leadership behavior uh, behind that. And that is all of the things we try to address. So how do you make it work? How do you make it work? I think indeed it starts once more with investing in the people and uh, the, and identifying your purpose, but then uh, putting it to life by simple strategies. In Unilever, that was, for example, decouple our growth from environmental impact, increase our overall social impact. We made a goal of reaching 1 billion people improving their health and well-being. We've basically achieved that by building toilets, 100 million, by Dove self-esteem, working with women, again, 100 million, by reaching a billion people with hand washing, with programs like Lifeboy. And all of our brands put purpose at the core, but with a very, very simple objective to achieve one of these sustainable development goals. You need to put the structures in place, the capabilities, the feedback loops. One of the reasons I stopped quarterly reporting stopped giving guidance, changed the compensation system to the longer term, was indeed to provide that space, uh, clear measurements of what, where you have your biggest impact. All of our brands, we measured our impact across our total value chain. And we could see in which sites we had to work on water or human rights or on uh, waste or uh, uh, carbon emission, if you want to. So we started to be very focused. Then it's a question of sequencing and uh, embedding it in the culture. And and there is a very important thing that at least stuck to my mind when I read uh, Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of, of Highly Effective Leaders. He talks about something that says, um, you cannot talk yourself out of things you have behaved yourself into. So it's absolutely crucial that in the day-to-day -day activities uh, that you behave rightly. People will remember what you do, not what you say. So interesting that you say that last point, uh, Paul, that's also one of the principles that we see. Basically, you have to act yourself into a new way of thinking. Um, and that's also why we um, at Uno Social Business argue that, you know, just get started, uh, create a social business as a corporation, try to basically create a business unit that is just there to solve a social or environmental problem. And when you do that and just think differently than, oh, let's maximize shareholder profit, you will come into a new way of acting and thereby into a new way of thinking, which will hopefully have an impact on the broader company. 
But just to that exact point, I mean, you know that the Unusual Pioneers platform um, that we're launching today here is really a platform for corporate social entrepreneurs, intrapreneurs, right? And um, so people within the companies that are trying to make that change. And of course, also their executives who are here in the room with us. Um, so perhaps you can share also the role that in your eyes, the whole topic of corporate social entrepreneurship um, has um, has had within Unilever or in other companies that you've observed over the years to actually create that internal, let's say, counterculture uh, to the typical only shareholder value maximization um, way of thinking about that. Yeah, so so uh, there were some comments that you made before. You mentioned the, the focus on social business progress within an organization. And I think the wonderful example of Microsoft came up in the little video no, sorry, um, Medtronics came up in the video that you showed. I actually start from the premise that that has to be the norm for the whole organization. So it shouldn't be a part of an organization. It should be the way we do business. You know, it's I have a hard time with all these um, asset managers that say I have here an ESG fund that is trying to do better. And then I have the rest of my portfolio. What are they trying to say that the rest of their portfolio is trying to make this a worse world for everybody, it just doesn't fit. So, um, for example, in, in India, the, the uh, CSR tax of 2% doesn't make any sense. You have to force all the companies to behave responsibly. Just like uh, Mohamed was saying, we should be operating under no waste. A comp uh, nature doesn't have any waste. Waste was invented by human beings, so we can also uninvent it. In Unilever, for example, on waste, I set the goal of zero waste for all of our factories. At that time, we had 567 factories. And um, my product supply manager said that will be very difficult to achieve and it will be co cost a lot of money. I said, just take five years to think about it because a lot of things can be designed out of systems that Bill McDonald would say the same thing. Uh, and if you have to change it very quickly, that might cost money and that is inefficient. But we achieved it actually in three years time and we stopped completely our ways to landfill and we found ways in many examples to upcycle and in fact found a lot of business opportunities. For example, Hummus is a very um, uh, desired product now. It's con connoted to health and, and the market is growing fast. But the water when the beans are soaked is called aquafaba. Now we decided to use that water and make, for example, vegan mayonnaise from that. And that was the start of a company that uh, saw Kensington in our case that did very well. So in any of these examples, you can not only reuse your waste, you can actually upscale and get more out of it. So coming to entrepreneurs in an organization, uh, I, I do agree as well with, with Sam Ahmed that we have all uh, the entrepreneurship inside of ourselves and that it is about job creation. Now, you don't need to work for yourself. You can work with others in a collective to do that. And that is what I would like to see as a corporation. In Unilever, um, we didn't have major restructuring. Uh, the people on our payroll actually were more or less the same when I left as when I came. I didn't fall in the trap of Kraft Heinz of a little junky quick, very quickly of Adrenaline by cutting costs by one third and moving margins up and getting the shareholders to be happy, but then pay the price for that the next day. We built the business consistently for the longer term. And we grew a business from 38 billion to uh, the low 50 billions. Uh, we created 5 million jobs for people in our value chain. We especially focused on women, by the way, to ensure that, uh, that we had uh, equal uh, representation of women and men. We extended the concept of diversity through our total value chain and, uh, and creating uh, enormous amounts of jobs. So entrepreneurship uh, in an organization, I think works as much as as in uh, any other uh, organization. And, and frankly, we need many different forms with the, the challenges uh, that we have out there. So uh, there's no question in, in Unilever that the biggest ideas came from the people on the front line. And uh, many companies are inside out companies where they think that they can uh, push it down your throat with advertising, with promotions, with spending, uh, but they've forgotten what the real needs are. Uh, one of the reasons I created the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan was actually to make it an outside-in company, where we said the, the main priority is 
the citizens that we need to serve and we need to understand their problems which are very well embedded in the sustainable development goals and guess what because we have waited so long to address these issues we are now at the point that the cost of not acting as COVID has shown is significantly higher than the cost of acting which means that any entrepreneur or entrepreneur will see enormous opportunities to implement the sustainable development goals only costs an incremental three to four trillion dollars a year on COVID, the cost of failure if you want to of not acting we have just spent 17 trillion dollars in the us and europe alone our gdp has suffered by 25 trillion dollars according to the world bank we see the tragedies unfolding like now again in in afghanistan uh, conflicts and wars in this world absorb 8 to 10 percent of GDP that's three times more than what it cost us to implement the sustainable development goals so all of this to say that if we internalize those into the, our businesses if we know how to work with uh, in partnership at different levels of, of cooperation then uh, we could uh, potentially unlock enormous opportunities with uh, my final sentence would be an example with um, there are some bottlenecks for companies alone to address many of the issues. Morma talked about plastics in the oceans, for example, or regenerative agriculture. Very difficult for individual companies to solve the whole issue. But what if you get a critical mass of companies by industry sector across the value chain together and build that courageous leadership? align on these common objectives for humanity, then all of a sudden, I think you not only see the leaders becoming more courageous, but also you can drive the systems changes. We're now with 30 of the biggest food companies moving to regenerative agriculture, which allows us to pay the farmer for keeping carbon in the ground, to restoring soil health, to attacking issues of food waste, to collectively work on habit changes of what healthy dietary requirements would look like to provide better livelihoods to the farmers and uh, what we find is that if you work collectively on that you cannot uh, you cannot only address these issues but you actually find so many opportunities where systems need to change that it also drives the overall well-being of the companies that you lead no uh, fantastic points paul so basically you're saying in some ways like the cost of waiting for the disaster are a lot higher than now investing as a corporation in preventing that we go entirely down the drain as a civilization. So we need to do this now. Um, um, and also that indeed, of course, entrepreneurship, like the people at the front line in the companies, they know what the company is capable of doing. And we need to also harness them to actually drive that change. But of course, there needs to be a strategic agenda also coming from the top of those corporations. And that uh, is kind of like that uh, interlinkage and, and including basically broader industry um, alliances is, is the key to success. Um, so I know we are unfortunately running out of time now um, and because we have to close. I will ask you one final, very short question, Paul, just on a personal note, which is what um, would you say you're most proud of in your, uh, in your decades of corporate life? Well, I don't know. Actually, I actually never asked myself that question. It might sound a little bit, but I was, I've always been very vocal not to focus too much on my legacy because I've seen too many CEOs try to focus on their legacy and ending up doing the wrong thing. I mean, leadership is first off and foremost about putting yourself to the service of others knowing that by doing so you're better off as well. I think what what we could perhaps say is that we, in our own modest way with Unilever and, and with the all of the incredible hard work of our partners and, and all of our employees have shown that business can be done differently, that you can ensure that you have successful businesses by operating under these longer term multi-stakeholder platforms with uh, purpose at its core, if you want to. And uh, that has given us courage. This, this society lets different economic models exist in parallel. And some of these economic models uh, are outright destructive. Um, you know, I've, I've always felt, I, I always like to quote the Dalai Lama who said that uh, if you seek enlightenment for yourself, uh, simply to enhance yourself and your position, you miss the purpose. But if you seek enlightenment for yourself to enable you to serve others, you are with purpose. And I hope that we have shown that business with purpose can be a very successful business. Not different from, by the way, 
for each of us individually as well. Thanks, Paul. Uh, thanks also for your modesty and reminding us that we shouldn't put our egos in the foreground. Um, I think that's that's also a very relevant lesson that it's more about serving rather than uh, as leaders, um, rather than well, trying to put our egos out there. So thank you so much. A big, big thank you uh, uh, to Paul for, for sharing your time and sharing your wisdom. Um, also, big, big thank you again to Professor Yunus for sharing your time and wisdom. This will now be the end of the public part of the executive circle. Um, and I am going to say thank you to everyone who has watched us um, on the live stream. Several hundred people have been there listening in and chatting with us. Um, and I saw that they were from all around the world, uh, um, Canada, uh, all over Europe, Africa, Latin America, et cetera, et cetera, so Asia. So uh, um, we had a, a fantastic audience and um, big thank you to everyone that joined. There will be an upcoming Unusual Pioneers talk. So just check us out um, on LinkedIn and you will um, see more of those coming up. Big thank you and I'll end the official